what has changed in our 25 years of democracy, especially around the built environment. I think you can agree with me that as much as we are putting so much energy into trying to transform the built environment, it seems as if we are not moving an inch. Let us first look at the numbers. I don't have a slide that talks to the numbers, but I will just talk to the average. The number of previous disadvantaged individuals registered as professionals across is still very low. Our recent uh, reports, we are looking at the average of, 20, of only 27%. And again, if you compare this with the, our demographics, you can see that there's something that is not right there. And then on the average, females only constitute 11%. Again, when you study the demographics of our country, we know that females are about 51%. Legislation such as Triple uh, PFA and Triple uh, BE, BE Act, these were created to redress the imbalances of the past. But really, have we yielded any desired outcomes? especially when we are looking at our built environment professionals. The councils for the built environment professions, particularly those with the low registration numbers, are experiencing challenges to implement their legislative mandate as they do not generate sufficient revenue from registration fees to sustain themselves. Remember, this also depends on whether the professionals themselves are employed and they are running successful businesses. So these uh, councils, they rely on the registration from those uh, built environment professionals. There are critical issues in, within the built environment. There is the issue of non compulsory registration for persons that are practicing within our sector. This also influence the low registration numbers that we have within our councils. There is also the, 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 the issue of lack of enforcement of identification of work for the professions. This also has resulted in the professional, in the persons or professionals that are operating in an unregulated environment. I want to say that I think Ugrigori uh, has mentioned that OCBE has started to uh, to gazette the, the scope of work. We've been engaging with the Competitions Commission, and I think in that area where we are making a stride. Uh, the poor retention of built environment professionals by the public sector due to policies such as the OSD. Wherever they, where we go as CBE, the OSD becomes a thorny issue that we cannot attract and retain built environment professionals within the public sector because of this uh, policy. So these are some of the things that you want to engage with uh, during this uh, transformation in Denver. The digital technologies have begun to enter the industry, gradually changing how infrastructure, real estate, and other built environment assets are designed, constructed, operated, and maintained. This raises the question, are we ready? Are we ready and are we geared to embrace the technologies that are changing the face, look, and feel of the industry and how can we upskill the workforce that we currently have to meet those demands and the demands of the future? So therefore, also transformation also goes beyond quotas. And I think, of course, quotas is a good start, but it's got to go beyond that. And of course, then, in this context, it speaks to how we as a sector are able to design and innovate on the current sets of skills in order to meet the changes globally. To, to, to defeat apartheid, some of us had to fight with arms in hand. Now, to defeat economic exclusion requires even a much deeper, much harder struggle from you professionals, black professionals. Um, and to win that war, you've got to organize yourselves and to continue pushing. 
Because you are talking about breaking barriers. How do you break barriers when you are not struggling? They won't break themselves, the barriers. And this is across the board. You go to, into mining industry, where I happen to serve as well. Um, black professionals don't work in there. What happens is you will find some ownership of mines by black people, but they hire white contractors. So there are barriers there. And <clears throat> the simple message I want to give is that you have to organize and continue organizing and never give up, never relent. What are the recommended changes as far as public works is concerned and to those who share the same aspirations with us? Taking note that the aim of this regulation is to transform the construction industry while uplifting the previously disadvantaged. Inadvertently, the regulation is impeding the implementation of projects due to the vast number of non-responsive bids resulting in missed employment opportunities either as a direct labor, as an SME, or as a supplier. And those who are on the cold face of it, typical example to this, we have got huge projects that currently we cannot conclude on the basis of these processes that have been regulated, which could be far better handled post the award. And that particular process is affecting service delivery. The budget has already been allocated by National Treasury, but we can't spend because of all these impediments. But we're not saying this is a whole impediment, but there are other factors which we can talk about uh, if we're allowed to deal with those issues. Secondly, subcontracting should not be a responsive criteria at all. All subcontracting should be implemented after or post the award. As part of the recommended changes, we are saying enforcing the rule of having to enter into agreement at tender stage boils down to a form of nominated subcontracting, which brings about its own challenges. The bidder then reserves the right to only use the SMSs with whom they have entered into agreements. That's what it means. You cannot deviate from those that you have entered into agreement. If you do that, you are in violation of the very same regulation. In reality, the local community and the SMEs forums will not allow this to happen, and the bidder will be forced to source other SMEs, which nullifies the requirement for having to submit the details and agreements prior to tender as a responsive criteria. So what, what are we saying in terms of this particular statement? We are recommending that the 30% subcontracting must be a condition of tender to advance that very same objective, which could be managed post-award through a transparent process. That is our viewpoint.